Hello and good afternoon to everyone. One final session between this and the beer, so um, stay, stay with us, uh, yeah. let's get to it. We hope you will enjoy. All right, but we would like to start a few words about ourselves before we will go to the session. So my name is Krzysztof Białowons. I'm from Poland and I know that it can be, for most of you, very hard to uh, pronounce. So a lot of people say me Chris or KB. Uh, I'm a developer and I'm a system architect. Uh, I'm working for ESV and also have my own uh, company. You can find me on my blog and also on the meetings which we call BC Beerinars. From time to time we have online meetings and also live meetings. So please follow to see when you can yeah. drink a beer and have fun. I would highly encourage you to join the BC Beerinars. They're always a lot of fun. So I'm uh, Jesper schulz wedde and I'm the engineering manager uh, of the Business Central Application Foundation team. Uh, my team is mainly responsible for the system application, um, developing all the modules that you need to build you know, world-class, um, tall ERP products on top of it. Uh, and then also, uh, the reason why I'm here today with KB is that uh, I'm also responsible for our open development story. Um, so I'm going to talk about half an hour like, about like if you would like to contribute, if there's something that is missing, then how can you go about doing that? Um, I've been on the BC team for 15 years now. Time flies when you're having fun, I guess. Um, and then, well, then the last mission that I have is kind of, you know, trying to bring the community and Microsoft even closer together than we already are. And I think open source or open development is one of the ways to do this. So yes, okay. let's get to it, KB. Yeah, so let's start with the system app. But how Business Central is structured now. So let's go through from the, uh, from the top, in fact, not from the bottom, from the top. We have PTE apps. This is which every one of you probably is doing those uh, apps, so pertinent act, uh, uh, apps uh, where customers need some uh, special uh, development. Then we have also ESVs apps where you can find them on App Source. Uh, and with some uh, new functionality which probably extend the base app in a lot of places. Uh, of course, we have base app where, in fact, all the business logic should be and only business logic, uh, but we will find their customers, vendors, and uh, this kind of, uh, of uh, objects. But the main goal today is to talk about the system app and what we can find in the system app and what it is. So at least for now, how it is, the system app is a, is a, a lot of libraries which can be useful for developers. So I guess most of you are developers here. So that can be uh, used and in a few clicks we can just develop new functionalities. So how the by a system app looks. In fact, it's, uh, it contains a lot of modules which you can think about Lego blocks. And one of them, for example, can be Azure storage integration or camera and image. I will try to show you all of that. Um, but there is much more. And luckily, uh, thanks to Jesper and his team, we have access on GitHub to all of that. So hopefully you can see it. Uh, if you will go to github dot, uh, slash Microsoft slash AL app extensions, you will find modules and then you can go to the system and you will find a lot of modules in that system. Uh, good to know is also how you can see later what you can see in all those modules. So let me just find any which can be, let's say, confirm management. So when you will go to the uh, uh, GitHub and then you will open any of the modules, first of all, you will see what is the structure, you, what is the documentation, like what are the public objects, like for example, confirm management, and what are the function in that. And also what are the examples, like for example, here we can see, and parameters and so on. So you will find all of that here. How it's, if we will go a little deeper, if we will go to the source of, the, uh, of that, you will mostly see two objects. One is uh, 
confirm management in this case, the same as na um, name of the module. The second one is confirm management implementation. Very important is that we don't have access to the implementation. So we only use, as a developers, we use something which is uh, without the implementation. So it's like a uh, so-called facade, facade uh, 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 pattern. So you can see that here is this function which was in the documentation, get respond or default. And it's just returning the uh, uh, value of the function from the implementation code unit. As I said, you cannot go to the implementation and use that, you, see, you can see the code, but everything with the implementation will be marked as uh, access internal. So we cannot use it, only Microsoft can use it. Okay, let's go back to my presentation. So we will not only find uh, on the, in this repository modules, we also will find much more. I will not focus on that today, but I would like that you will also know it and you will be able to find that code as well. For example, you can see the source code or, or, uh, of all standard APIs or Shopify connector and you can also do the pull request to fix something in uh, SharePoint connector if there is anything. One, uh, another one which is uh, nice to know is also demo data for manufacturing and for example, test libraries. So where we can find all of that, we just need to go a little higher and as you can see, I'm just now in the modules and in the dev tools and I can find test framework, for example, or as you've seen uh, on the screen, for example, performance, performance toolkit. If we will go even more higher and we will go to modules and for example to system, but I wanted to go to apps, and for example to W1, you will find APIs. And if we will go to apps, you will see also all the APIs, for example. Right? So this is the place where you also can contribute, but also you can see that. All right, but this session is an example, so that's almost all my slides which I have. Uh, but uh, we got a task. Normally we got in, uh, getting the development task. So what is our task? We, uh, the customer wants, or the end user wants to export all uh, customers in the XML file. Easy? Easy. But they also would like to compress it with zip. And they would like to send this file with the Azure function. Oh, there is go mo going more. But they would like to store the copy on Azure Blob Storage or on SharePoint. And they also would like to send email confirmation that such, uh, such thing was sent to the, uh, to the Azure function. And only from the production environment, of course. And every second Monday of, of the month. So, question to you, how much time you think it could take without co-pilot to develop that? <laughs> Half an hour, someone said. Okay. Do you agree? I agree, but okay. <laughs> 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 All right, and I should be, uh, I should ask before the session if there are any managers on the, uh, on our stage here or, or, or in our room, uh, because what you will see, you will see that, to be honest, I will be talking and showing you no more than 100 lines of code today, right? So that's how easy it can be, and I will show you much more examples. I don't know even if we will go through all examples, but it doesn't take a lot thanks to the system app. So let me uh, dig into the um, uh, to Business Central. Uh, I will just refresh this one. All right. And I would like to show you uh, this scenario, but as I said, it's a building block, so all of that will be like we will just build the blocks 
uh, we could do at the end. Before that, maybe some other things also which can be useful from the system app. Uh, let's start with the photo, maybe. Right, we like photos. So uh, let's go to the purchase order. So how Business Central can do the photo of both of us. And remember, it's maybe much easier if we talk on tablet or phone. But I hope you can see us. You know, when I'm doing I demo for our system, is uh, I have a lot of pictures like that. Oh, and I have photo. All right, so how we did that? Let me just go to our examples. I will go to a camera. And yes, I created an action, but I will not uh, talk about the action here. Let me just take you uh, see how I use uh, the system app just to take that uh, photo. You can see that I'm using the code unit, which is called camera. And I just need to check if it's available. It is. And I just need to use one function. Right? So this is how easy it is. And then I'm just saving the picture, which uh, is um, uh, um, uh, in stream, just to save the in stream with the term blob. OK. So but now you've got, what, 95 lines of code left for the remaining demos? So yes. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. But OK, I, I will take by myself. <laughs> But yeah, sometimes you just need to flip the picture as well. Oh, OK, I flipped it the wrong way. <laughs> but you, you get the point, right? You can also flip the picture. You can get a size. You can also shrink the picture, like, for example, if you want to have a tomb nice and so on. So again, let's see how we did that. And this is one more. I use the same module, so I use camera. But I also needed to transform the image. So let's go to this, uh, to this function. As you can see, I have only one code unit to do that. It's called image, right? Do I want to flip it? Yes, rotate, flip, and I just need to say which, uh, which direction I would like to flip. And I also shrink it a little, right? So with one function crop, I just crop it. Hmm. That was pretty much easy. The other thing which I'm using also uh, on daily basis is that I need to know geolocation of some of the records which we have in the database. So let's try to find where we are. Let's go to the fixed asset. I could just tell you. Yeah, I know sometimes it's easy just to look on the phone. Uh, but I can just get geolocation, and this is a geolocation of this fixed asset. This is also not very complicated to get. So let's see uh, how we did that and uh, go here. And as you can see, this is only two li three lines of codes, right? So I get the geolocation, and I just uh, put two decimal values here to get it. Very easy, right? I know. This is why I said it's take uh, half an hour. Um, OK. But one of the examples which I'm always uh, showing, especially if you are working with the cloud, and uh, there is a lot of apps on App Source, sorry guys if you have them, which allows you to uh, print the barcodes. Right? Uh, I'm not using any of the apps, I'm just using what inside Business Central is. So can I use System App to generate the uh, barcodes? Of course I can. So if I will go to the items, And I think it's called barcode. Uh, no, item barcode, yeah. This report which I would like to. And let's just choose one and do the preview. Oh, you can see that I really uh, printed the barcodes oh, like this. And it's not only not only one dimension, but also two dimension barcodes. And that's only the example. There is much more uh, ones which I need to do. How I did it? 
Let's go here and let's go to the report. You can see that I have just a columns which I named exactly the same as the uh, as a, uh, variables for the uh, for the uh, barcodes. But to generate the barcode, in fact, I just use one function or with the enum as well. So first, I just uh, do the implementation of interface, and then I just get encode uh, function, and I set what enum I would like to have. Hmm. So this is how easy you can do the barcode, but there is one more catch. We just need to open the mm, uh, Word document just to show you how it looks when we are printing. Not great, right? Because uh, uh, if we will just click one, you can see that this is the font which we are using. So maybe on the layout it doesn't look nice, but when we print it, you've seen already the barcodes, right? So with two lines of codes, we can just get a, a, print, a print of the barcodes. But of course, you, if you are using on-prem, I heard from one of the partners that you need to have a license for those uh, fonts. On cloud, right. you don't need to because Microsoft is paying for it. Okay, so let me go to this uh, example which we were talking uh, a, a bit. Uh, so uh, we were talking about that someone would like to export uh, customers to the XML. And yes, we could use uh, uh, um, we could use uh, XML port for that. I know, but there is also one another um, uh, another uh, module which can help us with this. So let's go to the customers. And let's click export to Excel, uh, to XML, sorry. You can see that my XML has been created. Uh, sorry that I'm showing it here, but let me just not switch uh, switch now. How, we did, uh, how I did it. Little more li lines of code. But also something which was very easy, especially using Chad uh, 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 Copilot. So there is a XML uh, writer which just allow me to start the document, start the element, and just write the code uh, for each customer. And I'm just adding the element. And if I would like, I can also that add the attributes. But I also can add the elements, strings inside this. Uh, this attribute, right? At the end, I'm just saving it to the big text. That's all what I needed to do, right? So with the, uh, with the uh, module, I just was able to quickly create an uh, XML. To be honest, I hate using XML ports, but mm, that's uh, everyone's uh, opinion. But they also ask that we would like to uh, uh, um, we would like to export it to zip file. So let's see if we can do it again very simply. So let's go to the zip file. And as you can see, I have two files with the customer. Hmm. How much I need work for that? Let's go to our zip and you can see that again I use one function from the code unit which is called data compression that's also part of the system app and I just create a zip file here and just put those two uh, to the data uh, uh, and add entries from the uh, from in stream right customers one and customer two in this case I just use uh, the same but if we will go to the data compression, you can see that it's little more than only that. We have also gzip compression, but we also can open zip archive. We can remove the entry if we would like, and we also would, uh, can uh, uh, get entry list of all the files. So as you can see, again, we're using just a few lines of code, and, um, and we uh, didn't need to develop so much just to do it. All right, the next one will be a little more tricky because we would like to do it on Azure Blob Storage, right? We would like to put it on Azure Blob Storage. 
I will not put it on Azure Blob Storage. I will put it on SharePoint, but uh, also in System App, you will find something for Azure Blob Storage. So let's go to Azure Blob Storage. And as you can see, uh, I just need the storage key and Azure account name to connect to Azure Blob Storage. So that's not a lot. Uh, if I will uh, click list containers, it will, uh, can, it will get from the Azure storage the whole list of all the container, uh, containers which I have. So if I will choose one, I also can choose the files which are there. So let's go and choose a list of the files. And you can see that I have three files there. And I can even uh, show you that, that this is exactly this is exactly what I have. So let me just switch to my Azure. Go to the storage. Which one I said it is? PC Tech Days. Okay, let's go to my containers. You can see that I have my container, which is called BC Tech Days, and I also have exactly three files here. So if I also will click that I would like to get this file, I get it also to my, uh, uh, to my uh, computer. So how we did that? Let's go to the Azure Blob Storage. Here I needed to do a little more work, unfortunately. First of all, I needed to create some pages. Yeah, the setup page, that's something which you probably will also need to do, and the table. Uh, in this case, I have my uh, Azure account name and storage uh, key uh, uh, for that, and that's the minimum which we need. And also the container name would be helpful. Then we can uh, need to create a page which is for Azure containers. It, can, uh, it is based on the system table, system app table, which is ABS container. There is no such page in the uh, system app uh, because uh, everyone can uh, use different, uh, different things. So I have uh, one field there, which is just a name. And that was my preparation, which I had. Oh, sorry, maybe one more. Uh, again, the page for the uh, container content. This is the page which you have seen. And this is, again, um, based on the system table, which is called uh, ABS container content. And I just put the fields from that table. But in general, the whole uh, configuration uh, in, in uh, connection is very easy. If I would like to list uh, containers, you can see that I just get the, uh, my table. I just make an authorization to that. So this is the interface with the storage service authorization, and I uh, create a shared key and, uh, and put the shared key here. And I initialize uh, the container client with my account name and my authorization um, interface. And then I just use the function to list the containers. There is also a few more. You can create containers, delete containers, and much more. Right, so all of those functions, you don't need to care about it. You just need to run one function, for example, to delete the whole containers. And that's uh, how it easy it is. I just run my uh, page later. The same with the down, uh, download file. Story is the same. I get the, file, uh, I get the setup, I made an authorization, I just lead, lead the blobs. And uh, uh, to my, uh, uh, to my uh, uh, table to, to, to system table, which is container content. Hmm. That was quite easy to send files uh, or get files from the Azure uh, storage, and I don't need to store those files in the uh, blob. But I also can do connection with SharePoint. So connection with SharePoint is a little more tricky. 
Um, only because we use uh, in standard system app uh, authorization and you just uh, uh, system to uh, system to system authorization. AJ can confirm that. Uh, so you need to first register the app on uh, on uh, Azure to be able to uh, uh, to connect to that. Uh, but if I would like to just list the folders of my SharePoint, you can find that this is my folders which I have there. And for example, one of it, I think, is somewhere, uh, is shared documents, which I have one document there. But I would like also, so let me just show you, this is exactly this. I have just one, uh, I have just one file. Uh, but let's uh, uh, try to put some file to the, uh, to the container, uh, to the SharePoint. So, yeah, we will just take the same file which we took from the Azure, uh, Azure storage and we will get an error. Uh, that wasn't expected. <laughs> Demo gods, right? So let me just check another one and if it will not work. Let me just check. Ah. Forbidden. Okay. Yeah, some authentication not working. Ah, of course, I know why I, I delete the This and, and take that one. Okay. Yeah, this is when you just go too fast. So as you can see, my file has been just created. Uh, again, how we do that? Um, so let me just go to the SharePoint connector. Uh, the same story with uh, Azure Blob Storage. Uh, Setup page, yes, that's something which I needed to do and table. I needed to do the page for the files. So I have it also on uh, uh, my source table is SharePoint, uh, SharePoint, uh, SharePoint file, which is a system app file, a uh, system app uh, table, and I just put uh, two fields here. Uh, the same with the uh, SharePoint list. I also use the SharePoint list folders and I can just see all the folders. Uh, but how we upload the file, maybe that can be um, uh, nice for you. Uh, we, get the, uh, we, get the, uh, uh, we get the setup, uh, we just use file management to uh, get the blob, uh, but later we initialize, uh, sorry, we get the tenant ID, we initialize, and we just use the function which is called add file to folder. And I think here I will just say a few words because uh, uh, we cooperate, my company and one of the developers, Conrad, uh, he, uh, uh, he made that, uh, that uh, whole uh, SharePoint module. And we just uh, do the pull request uh, to uh, Microsoft. Uh, the nice thing there was that we also get a lot of that. It turns out that there was some issue which was fixed by someone else. And I know that there were also a lot of questions and why there is no one function or something. And I seen that a lot of people already contribute to that. So you can see that you also can contribute and make something uh, that everyone will uh, be using. Yeah, and we as Microsoft learned a lot of from this as well. I mean, uh, so, you know, every developer and every company has a different coding style. So having to go through the code that uh, uh, KB's company delivered was quite interesting and, and very you know, giving for us and then figuring out how to get this into this stage was actually a very cool process. So I encourage you to do the same if you feel for it. Yeah, uh, the same is with the list files. As you can see, I just need to, uh, another function from SharePoint, uh, SharePoint client code unit and that's get folder files by server uh, relative URL. But if I will just show you a little more, you can see that there is much more like create uh, folder, create list, create list item, attachment. I know that is also uh, something which I hope will get soon to the system that you will also be able to do the metadata for the files, right? And that's all with just one function which we just need to run uh, from the uh, system code unit. Okay, our customer also w uh, wanted that we will be able uh, to push it with the Azure function, right? Yeah. Uh, okay, 
So how we can use Azure function from Business Central and don't do a lot of coding for that? If we will go to the example of Azure function, you can see that I have only URL for Azure function. There is mar much, uh, much more option, but I will just use the easiest one here. So only with the URL. If I will run function, I hope I will get a message uh, that uh, we run the Azure function here. Yeah, welcome from the Azure functions. So uh, let me also show you how we, uh, how we did it. Let's go to the Azure function. And yes, yeah, setup page is the same story. So we just I just added one field to store someone the URL. But in fact, to run the Azure function, that was uh, quite easy. I just needed a few, uh, uh, few functions. First, I get the setup. Then I made an authorization again, uh, authentication in this case. Uh, and I create code authentication where I just put the URL. But of course, there is little more options he, uh, here as I remember. For example, create OAuth. And uh, just to get the response, I just uh, use the code unit, Azure Functions, and set and get response. Right? So this is where I just send the dictionary, and I also send the authentication. But you can see that you have little more. You have also sent, and you have sent uh, get and respond. So I always going to the uh, to uh, the functions if I need, and you can get all the uh, documentation in every place uh, like that. So send request, send post request, but you also see the send, and you have everything in the documentation. And again, uh, you can see how much code. Microsoft needed to write, in this case, I think it was Kenny who was uh, needed that function, and how much code in the background you would need to uh, write if you will just not use this one line of code. So pretty much more lines, 84, yeah. right? We do some, sometimes get the question, like, where can we find user examples of all of this, what KB is showing right now in the base app, for instance? Um, and Sometimes I have to answer, well, there are not always usage examples because not all of these things have actually been uptaken by ourselves yet. A lot of these modules were actually contributed by a partner that needed that for his you know, ISV or his or her uh, ISV or PTE app. Um, so actually, we are still you know, working on uptaking some of these ourselves. So I would encourage you, if you want to have usage examples, you know, either rewatch the session on YouTube when it's out <laughs> Um, or going to the test code units and take a look, uh, because very often the test code units you will find usage examples. Um, In the meantime, I also can say that we will publish this repository with the examples, so you Even can better. also uh, take them. If then you Copilot will. has something to go on. And Copilot it. <laughs> Feed it. Okay, so we have uh, Azure function as well. Let's little switch to different examples. I have a question to you. How, if you have two values, integer values or decimal values, how you will check or choose the bigger one or yeah, the bigger one? Would you use if x bigger than y then x and if not then y? And I was surprised that uh, um, yeah, one code review which I was doing and one of developers with whom I'm working, he did a little different approach. So you already seen uh, today um, uh, Vincent showing a mat, I think it was Vincent, right? Uh, showing mat module. But there is a lot of other things uh, as well or functions in this. If I would like to have, uh, let's say, here we have 10, here we have 30. And if we will just get max, it will show me the max, uh, max value of that. Uh, if I would like to get the minimum value of those two, I will see the minimum one. Okay, let's just put here something more. 
if I would like to do the floor, 213, maybe I should do like, yeah, and ceiling, 214. If I would like to truncate it, 213. And if I would like to get a reminder, I have no idea what will happen here, but let's just make 12, and five, I will get two. So you can see that, yes, you can use the mat uh, also in Business Central, and there is not a lot uh, uh, needs for that. In fact, I even didn't create a code unit for here because we just need one function. And this is from code unit mat. Not uh, a lot of us are uh, going there, but you can see that if I would like to have a max, then I'm getting a max. If I would like to have a minimum, I will just get a minimum. So I think there's only... That particular module is a good example of a .NET wrapper. So in reality, what we have been doing in the module is simply to take the .NET API and wrap it and make it available. So if you ever have any API uh, from the .NET framework that you would like to use, obviously you can't use it in PTEs and so on, make a pull request and we will happily accept it. If, uh, yeah, and it as you can, safe. yes. So as you can see, I have quite a lot of other functions as well. I never use uh, a logarithm, uh, a logarithm in Business Central, but the mix, uh, uh, man and uh, max and mix, uh, happened to me. Uh, if you would like to do the uh, uh, value of the P, you also don't need to hard code it, it's already there. So uh, all of that things you would find also in the, uh, in the math uh, uh, code unit. Okay. Um, let me also show you uh, another thing which I even after I did an example, I checked how we did in uh, in one of the projects, and I decided, yeah, we need to also uh, do the uh, 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 do the refactor of the code there because we made something with, with more lines of codes and a little more complicated that it can be. So uh, let's go to the customers again. Oh, I was already on customers, but I can just go to one of the customers. And I added the field which is responsible user. So I would like to choose the user, or I would like to write and check if such user exists. So if I will just put x, 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 that username doesn't exist, right? Makes sense. Uh, if I will just go here, I can see the page with the user lookup. Right, so if I will just click admin, I will have my admin. So as I said, we could do the find set of the users and uh, do the page with the users and so on. Uh, however, there is a little easier way to do it. As you can see, I just need one code unit again, which is called user selection. And I, if I would like to validate username, I just use validate username. And if we will just go down, you can see that they already handle all kind of that stuff. If username is empty, uh, if uh, uh, generally is empty and, and so on, if it doesn't exist, it's error. Uh, let me go back here. And the same is with the uh, lookup. So uh, for that, I just needed two fields, uh, two, uh, two variables. One is a user record, and the second is user selection. Why I need the user rec record? Because I can filter first uh, users and then I open uh, that. So in this case, I just filter system users and group users. Right? So if you will go here, you can see that they already handle uh, for me all the external users, license type, uh, AAD group, license type, Windows group. Right? So I'm covered, I don't need to do it. And uh, moreover, let me just uh, show you here. I have also um, another one also to f uh, filter. I can also uh, hide uh, users in this code unit and so on. And the thing, I even didn't need to create a page. This page, in fact, exists. So I just open, uh, open the page, and you can see that there is a, a user lookup page. 
what it gives me if ever Microsoft will change the page or whatever else they will change in that code uh, or fix, I will also get. And by Microsoft, maybe I'm a little wrong here. Anyone can, can do that. But let's not go so far. Um, so this is only that I just needed two fields to, uh, two, uh, two lines of code or three lines of code to handle uh, on validate and look up at the same time. All right. Let's go further. I remember there was a requirement from, from that, from that uh, function that we wanted to check if it's only for production, right? So uh, let's go to the custom uh, to uh, company information and let's check information about this environment. So what I can see, I can see this is the sa this is the sandbox. Good. This is the production. No, it is uh, uh, it is sun uh, it is uh, uh, SaaS so cloud, and there is an environment name. Yes, exactly, it's sandbox. Uh, I also have some information about the tenant ID because I'm just using here uh, that uh, tenant ID without the display name. So how we get that? That should be also pretty easy. So let me just go to, 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 to user, to user to environment. And I just made uh, one function and uh, to be honest, I just need for this one code unit. And this code unit is called in, uh, information, uh, environment information. So what I have here, if uh, uh, it's production, and then Microsoft is handling if it's really production or not. I don't need to do anything with that. I can get a production name. I can then get a sandbox. I also can do as a uh, SAS. You see that I also can check if it's on-prem. Uh, financial infrastructure, get family name, and so on, so on, version installed, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I can check also that. So with just one functions, again, we get, we getting much more information. And the second code unit is called tenant information. And if we will go to tenant information, I have get tenant ID, and I, I have also get display name. So if I will just go here, you can see that they also handling that and I don't need to, to be honest, do anything with this. The one requirement as well, if uh, which I had uh, from uh, our users, they wanted to re-authenticate themselves when they are using Business Central. Um, we cannot force uh, Business Central, at least for now, to put another, like, uh, re-log re them and put one more time the password. Uh, but uh, there is a functionality to set up the password. So uh, password. So what we, uh, what we did is that uh, I also can uh, set up my personal password. And let's say easy tech day. And let's see. Oh, OK, it must have much more. Easy tech. Days 21. I hope it's this tech 21. So let me just make a quick custom password, which is we're doing all the best practices here, blah, showing blah, blah, the password, blah, blah, reading blah, blah, the password yeah, loud. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't use it, so you know, it's like, but. Uh, OK, I will not go to that, but you can see that I can put the password, and it's even working better than I would uh, co code it. Uh, and I just need to put the password and confirm the password. I also can change the password and uh, match uh, the password. So again, how we did that, uh, let me just go to, uh, to our password operations. And you can see that I have one function, which is called from the code unit, uh, password dialog management. And in that, I have open password dialog. And uh, here I have uh, mm, uh, some methods, which uh, I just, uh, there are all, uh, only overloaded with some 
additional parameters, like display, uh, disable password validation, disable password confirmation, uh, and so on, so on. I also have open uh, dialog passwords, which automatically have some. I also have a function to change the password, so I can just put old and, and new one, and there is some, uh, um, which probably I hope I can put minimum uh, number of uh, records. But as you can see, I have just password, and then I get password to check with my password, and I can show the error if the password is correct, if I would like to uh, type the password, and if I would like to change the password, uh, I have uh, the same open uh, change word uh, uh, password. This is how easy it is. Good stuff. Give me just a few more. Yeah, minutes. yeah, yeah okay. five more minutes for yeah, all right. even more examples, and then we switch <laughs> to something else. Yeah, good. So uh, the other example which I would like to show you is uh, related to choosing the object. And that's something which from time to time we need to do, that someone needs to choose the uh, table, for example, and also field from that. So let's choose the objects. Choose. Okay. So let me just choose my uh, table and let's uh, choose uh, not the first one, maybe locations, and then field name. Okay, I just need to choose base uh, unit of measure. As you can see, two fields, easy, just name and field, uh, how many uh, filters and so on I needed to do. Let's go and check. So uh, choosing the object. And I just put two, uh, 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 put one, and you can see that, again, I have just one, let's go here, code unit, which I just filter all objects. And uh, from the page objects, I just set the record. I don't need to create my own uh, pages for that. Uh, the same is with the filter uh, uh, fields. I just use the selected fields, oh, that was, uh, table 27, I hard coded it. Uh, and, sorry for that. And I just use uh, one uh, code unit, which is uh, field uh, selection, and I just uh, use only one uh, function, which is there open, right? And this is how much I needed. But again, I just would like to show you that this is not what is only happening. It's something which is in the background, so we don't need to code all of this, which you can see here. This is already coded for us. Um, I hope you know functionality which is called retention policy. So a retention policy, uh, retention policies uh, is the functionality which allows you to delete the data from the log tables to don't uh, have everything in the database, uh, all the records which are very old, like change log, like uh, retention policy log, and so on. And in general, you ha I, this requirement I uh, hear from time to time from the customers, oh, can we just delete this uh, uh, old data? We, we will not need it. And yes, we could create a job queue entry, delete the, table, delete the data, and so on. But Microsoft at some moment uh, at some moment also, let me just only create a new one. Um, yes. uh, at some moment also introduce such functionality and this uh, will just go automatically. So why we should bother with all the job queues and all kind of that stuff if we can really use this functionality. Uh, the only one catch is that they didn't add all the tables there and that makes sense because we should control which tables users can use, can uh, set up there. So uh, that makes sense to when I will open a uh, table ID, I will not see all the tables, but only those which are really should be deleted. And as you can see, there are few standard. Uh, but you cannot add anything to this table without small code. So I added my table, which I called my log table, and you can see this is my table, which is there. So how you can do it? Uh, if we will go to the retention policy install, again, very simple. Uh, I'm even embarrassed to showing this, uh, that I'm just showing you one line of code. It looks like I'm not prepared. 
in, uh, we just create a code unit which is called uh, uh, which is called um, uh, syst uh, uh, is a subtype install, and per company we're just adding our own table. And now customer can use this functionality with our uh, logs which we also have. Right, so just easy. Don't don't over uh, do uh, any additional things. Okay, I, I need to speed up. I see. So maybe from our uh, from our uh, solution, as you can see, I will not get to all of that. But uh, we said that customer also should get an email. So how easy it is to send an email with Business Central. Let's go to this customer which is not paying his invoices in my in my case. And I hope this is one which I choose my email. And uh, let's just uh, edit. And first I will just see what I will send. So you see that I added please pay and also to whom I should pay and why uh, to whom I should send. And I put also some message here. And I that should work. Yeah, that should work. And I also have very nice, uh, very nice, um, uh, rich uh, text editor, right, Jasper? Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, I can keep a draft. I can discard the email. But in fact, what I did in my scenario is only just I uh, choose the uh, code you need. Maybe before I created a scenario, because you know that you can send. Uh, different scenarios from the different email accounts. This is exactly what I did. So I create my own email scenario for that. And then I, uh, I just created an email and open it uh, in editor. That was so easy. And the same if I would like to send it, I again need to create it. But instead of email uh, open in editor, I just send it. So that's how we have and but you can see also how many we have function there for example and queue the email so it will be sent uh, will uh, will be sent all right i yep. think you've spent your 100 lines of code by now give or take okay. a few hundred more so i cannot <laughs> use more but nevertheless in the repository you will find some more maybe i should also only mention it like for example encoding to base 64 right so like if i would like to uh, uh, from base 64 and to base 64. Sorry. <laughs> and <laughs> can also somebody mute him, maybe? and so on. <laughs> no, touch. Uh, they can stay. They don't like beer. So uh, checklist and telemetry, all kind of stuff. Yes. <laughs> and then I will stop. Oh, that's a lot of good stuff in this. Yeah. As that. you can see, if you want to show everything, that's not enough 90 minutes. Uh, nevertheless, I also would like to show my last slide here uh, and, and also ask you a question. How many times you, you, you were waiting for Microsoft that to, to fix something? Anyone? See, that rarely ever happens. Yeah, that's not... Uh, <laughs> uh, seriously, almost no okay. one. Right? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> and we don't record them, right? So it's, yeah. it, it will be on the recording. But also, who of you fix it by yourself, not waiting for the Microsoft? Uh, OK, and those who raise their hands, uh, keep it. And who of you fix it in the Microsoft repository? There you go. You should <laughs> almost have a t-shirt. <laughs> yeah, you, you would get a t-shirt, but we don't have it. So uh, <laughs> We ran out of t-shirts. Yes. I don't know. It's like <laughs> Sorry that you no, are No, stay in the section, please. You, stay in the section. Please stay. <laughs> What I wanted to say that our world uh, really changed. I remember when I was starting in 2010 and th there was a one guy in the company who was doing uh, only talking with Microsoft. And 13 years later, uh, we, first of all, you see Microsoft on all the conferences. The second, you can ask questions on Twitter and they will really reply on it, not only on Yammer or anywhere else. But Chat GPT is so Chat awesome. GTP, yeah. <laughs> okay, so now I know how you reply. And, but also, the most important uh, part is that we also can contribute to that. A lot of things which I was showing you today, it wasn't wrote by Microsoft. For sure not Azure Blob Storage, for sure not barcodes, for sure not uh, SharePoint Connector. Probably some of them also, sorry, I don't know 
but uh, some of them, which I also showed, they are not done by Microsoft. They are done by partners, as you are. And to be honest, uh, that's also our message here. It's like you also can contribute and you also can do something that we will all be able to code faster. You can see five lives on code to connect to SharePoint. This is because Conrad did that and just put it. If you've seen yes. Azure Blob Storage, five lines of code, and you were al already be able to connect that. And now I will just... And that's my cue. Yes. So <laughs> and we're actually going to speed things up a little. <laughs> um, so some of the videos that I'm showing, or the demos that I wanted to show, I actually take a long time. Like one of them is one hour long, so I had to condense it to five minutes. Uh, so I can't do it live, uh, so these are recorded. I hope that you can see, uh, try to find the right screen resolution and so on. If not, feel free to come closer. So very quick agenda from my end. Um, I quickly want to talk about why having an open development model. Um, I think we probably covered that already. Uh, and then I want to show you how easy it is actually to contribute. So how do you get your contribution suggestion approved? How do you set up your and develop an environment or your machine to actually make a contribution? And then how do you get that contribution across the finish line? Uh, and I hope to be able to take you like really from one end to another uh, within these 30 minutes. And then I'm going to take a little look into the crystal ball, what's next, what's more to come. Um, I will talk about how we are going full open source on the system application. We are currently only halfway there. And then I will be introducing the new layer, the business foundation. So very quickly, why should we have an open source development model? Um, well, I guess it's, it's no secret that everybody by now knows that uh, I do love GitHub and open source. I think it's a brilliant way to collaborate. Um, and as turns out, there are more and more fans of it. Um, and I, like I do believe it. that there's a really good reason for that. And that is because when we work together like this, we become more than the sum of our parts. Um, we actually are able to achieve much more by collaborating this closely together. And this is why my tagline is, together we win. I keep saying that, I keep tagging that in my tweets, um, and I really do believe that message is true. Very quickly, a recap of some of my previous sessions, why I do believe this is a good thing. Um, well, it will accelerate product growth. Instead of competing against ourselves in like the lower level modules, if we collaborate on this, we can actually you know, develop what is important and not reinvent the wheel over and over again. And also, I do believe that the quality and auditability of um, the product that we're doing is getting better. I mean, the, the source is open. It's there for everyone to see. Um, so, you know, bugs just shine more than they do if, if you develop in private. And then also, if everyone can see what you're developing and they maybe have, you know, other ideas how to, how, what to use that module for, uh, then there will be nice discussions about how to extend it, how to customize it, how to make it compatible to other solutions. And you'll simply end up with a better API than if it was only tailored to your specific one scenario. And then the last two, um, we've talked about that plenty. I think it really fosters collaboration and it develops the community even further than where we already are. And all of that allows you to build tall verticals on a strong foundation that we built together, and it allows you to focus on the last mile, which is really where innovation happens. It doesn't happen in the blob storage module. It happens, you know, when you go beyond that. So how do you get your idea approved for contribution? Let's say you have, like, a, a module that you need to develop, and you want to have it in the system application. So first of all, I want to talk about like, how do we work internally at Microsoft? Because on GitHub, you know, we've got issues. So how does that map to our internal processes? Because that's currently a little bit of a challenge. At Microsoft, we've got bugs and slices. Those are the two things that we work with. And if we take a look at what the difference is between these two, then we see that a bug can either be, that's the most important, the most critical thing, the one that we always prioritize highest, is if it's a customer reported product defect can come through a support case, hotfix request, you name it. I guess most of you have tried to lock one of these. These can be procedural issues, like some process isn't working, which is blocking uh, business processes. Or it can be data issues where data is being corrupted, deleted, wrongly stored, and so on. Those are, as I said, the most important for us. And then there's another category, which is partner reported product defects. Those are the things that you usually probably fixed yourself when you got our code base and you had the code customization model. 
So it's all these paper cuts or like small missing functionalities where things aren't aligned, like this list works like that and the other list doesn't. Um, it can be collaboration requests where you're asking like, hey, can we work on this together to make our stuff work? Um, and also can be extensibility requests where you want to build upon something, but it's not quite extensible. And then there are internal reported product defects which come in all the shapes and sizes. So that's the bug category. The other category is slices, and those are usually um, part of larger stories. We call, refer to these as epics. It's like the investment areas that we're doing for a given release. Could be fundamentals, could be onboarding, could be manufacturing. The important part here is that these are much more complex, um, and that is where our product managers come in. So we can't do everything at once, so we pick our battles for every release, uh, and that comes into play in a minute. I'm going to explain. And then there are, of course, all the partner reported ideas that you know so well. They come from AKA BC ideas. And if, for instance, let's say we have opened the manufacturing box, then we look into BC ideas. How many ideas are there that would flow into or fit into this epic? And we'll try to address them. And important is these slices have exit criteria. They need to be documented. Um, they need to maybe have security reviews, uh, release notes. Uh, Maybe there's some deprecation that needs to happen. So there are all these things that need to fit together. So there's a lot more planning involved in these slices than on the, on the issue. So what of this, then, is a good contribution candidate? Well, customer-reported product defects aren't, because there's a customer out there hurting, they're losing money by the hour, um, and open source sometimes takes a little while, right? Um, they might have to go through some code review processes and stuff. So those are not good do use our support channels for that, and let's make sure that these are ironed out as quickly as we possibly can. My favorite, actually, are these partner-reported product defects. These are perfect examples of what we should collaborate on, because there is no like, competitive advantage in having, uh, like fixing a, a, one of these little paper cuts in a PTE. So we really shouldn't do that. We should work together on getting these out of the product. And when it comes to the bigger work. Um, oh yeah, right. Uh, so, so the top category is, uh, is what I would consider a GitHub issue. So it's very, very easy to like, explain what the product, how the product is misbehaving, and you can log it as a GitHub issue. The bottom part, um, I still believe we should start with as a BC idea. So do bring your idea for a feature out. Let's see how many agree that this is a great idea. Uh, and then we can approve that idea for a contribution uh, candidate and then you can start working on GitHub on that idea. But again, like it depends a little bit, so I've tried to put that in writing. Um, we will always approve paper cuts. Most of the time, unless they're too big and complicated, the horizontal building blocks, such as the SharePoint uh, was and so on, uh, bug fixes without production impact. The sometimes uh, box is like, uh, if our product managers decide that, yes, we have already opened the, the box, let's say we are looking into manufacturing, uh, and they have a complete idea about you know, how would things fit together, then we're very inclined to also accept pull requests in that area. If you all of a sudden come with a complete restructuring of item tracking while we're not looking into item tracking, then that probably you know, becomes a capacity issue on our end because things do still need to fit together, right? Um, so this is on a per-discussion basis. What we currently will never ever accept are product defects with customer impact. Also localizations, we cannot uh, because we only have W1 in our um, uh, GitHub repositories. And currently also actually event requests because we have a dedicated team trying to make this as quickly as possible um, and we don't want to have competing ways uh, of, of doing these things. Then it just gets confusing. So that's kind of what you can submit. All right. Um, Let's get ready for implementation. So let's, see, uh, let's say you, know, you are in Business Central and you go to the demand forecast page here. Um, and then you hover over you know, the, the headers here, and you see nice tooltips everywhere, and then you're like, what is source type? And there is no tooltip. Now, this is obviously too small a case to look for a support case for, right? I mean, that, that makes no sense. But let's just use that as an example for something that we want to fix. Um, now, in this case, it's not the system application, but it's the base app, but the entire process is, is the same or will be aligned. So we can go into, um, now I'm logged in as a developer, 
So I will actually now go in first and I will try to search. Um, and I will find nothing. Search first because others might have already locked it or are working on it, so it's always a good idea to search. Then we can say, hey, let's make a feature request, um, but then there's a little disclaimer saying, this is not the way. You should use BC ideas for feature requests. But you can create an issue. Um, and again, there's a little disclaimer here saying, like, if it's a customer defect, please do not use GitHub. Um, but other than that, we've got these sections where you, know, you need to um, describe the repro steps so that everyone can reproduce it, provide a saying title, um, and you know, provide all the information uh, that might be needed here for others to understand the issue that you're logging, and also for, obviously, Microsoft to understand what it is you're attempting to do. So, for instance, you know, go to the demand overview and hover over the field source type, and now I would expect that I see a tooltip, but I don't. So that's the issue. And there you have it. That is actually enough uh, sufficient for a little issue. I'm going to tag this as sample, and we can submit it. So now, if in the Microsoft Office, I'll be sitting at my desk, and I'll see, ooh, there's a new issue. Nice, let me take a look. Uh, so I open that one, and now I'm exaggerating a little bit here. So, I'm, so the idea here is that we will discuss until both parties or everyone understands what really uh, is to be implemented here. So I could, for instance, say, I would agree that the tooltip is missing, but before we go ahead and implement, let me know which tooltip you would like to add. So, you know, just to showcase there can be clarifying questions. And you see by now that it has the approved label, meaning we agree this is an issue, but it doesn't have the ready for implementation tag, which allows you to start creating a pull request. So um, the developer says, well, it sounds good that you agree with my findings, and I would add something along the lines of specify the source type of the availability calculation. Comment. And now I get an email, and I'm super excited to see what has come out of here. And, and I'm going to say, yep, that sounds about right. Let's do this. And then we're going to add the ready for implementation tag, which means now anyone who wants to work on this can go ahead and work on that. So this is actually all you need to do. Again, if, if there is a, a larger feature that you'd like to contribute, start with the BC idea, and maybe in the comments right you would like to contribute this. Um, then we're going to tag the BC idea, and it's going to show up in here as an issue that is already approved. But the rest of the process is the same. So how do you then get your development environment set up? And now it's good that this is recorded on YouTube because this is going to go seriously fast. Um, I'm going to go in a minute from a completely new Windows 11 machine that has just booted to you being able to compile, in this case, the base application. So let's see. Once you know how to, it's actually rather easy, but it is one of the biggest hurdles that we've been facing. So let me show you how, this, how to do this in a 10-minute walkthrough. Um, so first of all, of course, you need a PC. Um, <laughs> Does a small laptop suffice? Well, it depends I on what you, what you want to develop. Like, if it's, a, if it's a, a, a first party app or something, it's fine. If you want to play with the base app, uh, it's more like this thing that you need. 32 gigabyte minim minimum, I would recommend 64. Uh, the more cores, the better. The more fun you'll have developing. You just go for a longer coffee when you have four gigabytes. Yeah, but you'll drink a lot of coffee then. It's, it's not healthy for you, that these <laughs> amounts that you'll drink. So a little bit of a bigger machine is good. Um, then you need, a, in this case, a Windows machine. I'm sure someone has played with Linux and so on and can make it work. I can't. Uh, so Windows, you need a GitHub account and a very basic understanding of what Git is. You know, just take a Git 101. If you haven't, it's, you know, that's really all you need. And then there are some tools like Visual Studio Code, uh, the AL language extensions, Docker, et cetera. So let's roll the demo and see how we get all of that so you can Again, you can slow it down on YouTube later on. You can follow the steps. Um, let's see how this is done. So this is a Windows 11 machine. There's nothing installed at all. It's completely new, just to prove it. And off we go. So the first thing that we need is obviously, and this is where it gets fast, Visual Studio Code. Off we go. You take the Windows version. We download it. We install it. You can just use all the default settings unless I say anything else. Um, so Visual Studio is installed. Yum, that was fast, right? 
Now you go in and you get the AL uh, language extension. AL, and you install it, and whoops, done. Now you get Git, Git for Windows. Yep. Install default settings. You can change some. You don't have to. Install Git. It's all good. Done. Done. Almost. Well, it's a little bit longer. <laughs> a long Three so much. far. Now you can take Git CLI. It's a cool tool. We won't get into it in this demo, but it really, really helps you work with Git if you aren't familiar so much with these complicated things. PowerShell, PowerShell 7. You can also use the old PowerShell, but PowerShell 7 is just so much cooler. I encourage you, install PowerShell 7. It's, again, much easier to work with. Done. Done. Uh, oh, yes, Hyper-V. Now we need to install Hyper-V on Windows 11, because else you cannot run Docker. So install, restart. Now we've got Hyper-V on our machine. Woohoo! So now we're ready to install Docker. Let's go. <laughs> Docker is actually one of the few apps where we need to change the settings, so I'm going to slow down for a second here. In, in this case, we installed Docker for Windows, um, and that actually takes a while. But here's a very important setting. It says use WSL2 instead of Hyper-V, and if you do that, nothing works. So uncheck that one and install Docker. That takes actually quite a while. Um, not here, though. We've fast-forwarded through this. So now we've got Docker. We need to restart. We are back in the game. And now we actually have everything installed that we need. The next thing that we need to do is for Docker is to currently still run on Windows containers. Very soon you won't have to, but for now you still have to. Um, at least last time I checked. So you click down there in the button, and you say switch to Windows container. And now Docker runs in Windows container mode. And we are ready for some Freddy magic with his container helper scripts. So how do we get those into our machine? We open PowerShell 7 in this case. And all we need to do here is that we need to say import or install module uh, and then the BC container helper. And we force the installation. So now we get all this magic that Freddy is developing for us, um, which just makes it so much easier to work with Docker containers and Business Central. Now there are two minor settings we need to do. I don't know exactly why, uh, but I just always run into this. We need to set the Git username and the Git password. So don't ask me why, just do it, because else the system is not going to work. Um, so just setting these two. There we go. And that was it. Now our system is actually set up. So the next thing that we then need, obviously, is the code. So we will go to uh, GitHub, and we will start with ALAB extensions, just like we used uh, the rest of this presentation for. And you will find the repository. And now, well, let's sign in. That's always a good thing. And now what you can do here is that you can go to code, and you can say, you want to copy uh, this, and you can clone the repository. A clone is a one-to-one -one copy of whatever is on the GitHub repository, a one-to-one -one copy on your local machine. You cannot use clones for development. Um, I'm going to talk about that in a second. But you can use this if you just want to see what's in the system application. You want to have a local copy of it. Then you simply go uh, and create a folder, like repos, and you write git clone and you paste in the URL that you just got from the web page, and next thing you know, you have the entire code of the system application and first-party apps on your local box. If you would like to develop, uh, you need to actually use a fork. So let's go to the Business Central Apps repository here. Um, here we create a fork. You can read more about forks, uh, but it's like where you create a copy out of the, of the repository. But the rest is the same. You can now from your local fork, you can again clone to your local machine, and this you can use to develop on. So now we have actually the base app code on our machine as well, system app and base application code. Um, this took a little bit longer. So now we need to compile this, right? We need to start developing. Um, so how do we get there? We go into our repository. In this case, uh, it's the Business Central Apps repository for the base app. And we go into AL Go, and we write local dev env. And the only thing we need to do here is to specify a password, and that's about it. And wait. And wait. And it used to take, like, I think when I did this recording, it took an hour and a half or something. But Freddie has, in the meantime, brought it down to half an hour. 
the more power you have, the faster this will go, and we are hoping actually to make this even faster. And for the system application, it's a matter of a few minutes. So what's going on here is like it's uh, setting up the containers, it's compiling all the apps, it's creating the demo data you need, it's doing everything you need to have a running instance uh, of Business Central that you can develop in. So after a while, even though I speed it up like 100 times, it still takes forever. Uh, after a while, you will more or less be ready to go. So here we go. It said 5,263 seconds. So that's how long it took. But now if you go into Docker, you will see the BC server. Um, and it's running. So that means we now have a running instance of uh, Business Central on our machine. And we can now actually open the code. So if we go again to our repos, app, layers, w1, base app in this case, um, now we need to take two small settings. We need to create a settings file here. We hope to be able to automate this. But right now you need to point to where the .NET assemblies are. And the .NET assemblies, they are stored in the folder that you maybe can or cannot see. It's maybe a little bit too small. But it's somewhere in the BC container helper. Uh, there's a .NET packages folder. That one you need to reference. And the last thing that I also hope that we will get rid of real soon is that we need to specify the runtime that we want to use this in. That's it. F5 and depending on what machine you have, like you now you can drink a cup of coffee normally or not, depending on the machine, uh, it will actually compile and run the, uh, the code. Whew. 15 minutes to beer. I think we really need that now, right? So now you can actually you can log in, um, and you will have Business Central running. You can debug. You can do all the things that you would like. And contribute. And contribute. Now you're ready, right? Because now you've got the, the code that we have on GitHub on your machine running. So you can now start the contribution. Whew. All right. Need to breathe. Um, what other things? Settings should you do? One thing that I would advise you to do is enable rapid application development, especially when working with the base application. It just makes it so much more enjoyable when you recompile and republish much faster. So far, so good. So the last thing that we need to do here, um, we need to create our pull request. Um, in interest of time, I'm going to make this really, really short and not actually go through all the st uh, steps of writing tests and so on. So you find your issue, right, that we've created and that is now approved and ready for implementation. Um, and you say, well, I'm going to do this one. So you assign yourself. In this case, it's my MSGN 365 BC dev account. Um, and now we actually need to develop against the fork, as I mentioned. So this is the, the clone uh, of, of the fork that we are seeing here. And I already opened the file, and the only thing that we need to do is here in the source type text, we need to add our tooltip that was missing, right? So let's just put that in. Now, normally, you would obviously compile, run it, test it, and all these things. All that we skip here in the interest of time. You can now see that this is the change that we're trying to make. We're just adding a tooltip. That is great. Um, I now usually take the ID of my of my issue to identify the branch. So we can't work on the main branch, so we create a feature branch um, with the ID, some name. This is really up to you what you want to add here. Um, and now we've got this branch in a second. There we go. So now we can uh, write a commit message, update the tooltip, and we can commit the change that we made in our local code repository. We can commit that to our uh, branch here. And once we have committed it, we can hit the publish branch. And now what's happening is that the code that we've changed is being pushed up into, into GitHub. And if we go over here, you'll see the had recent pushes that less than a minute ago. You can create the pull request. Again, the better title and the better description you leave here, the better off everyone else is going to be when they're reviewing your code or trying to contribute maybe even to your PR. You can see the changes. Um, so yeah, add a little uh, commit message here. And when we have written that one, in this case it's add a missing tooltip to the source type field, we can click, click create pull request. Now what happens is that uh, our CICD pipeline kicks in, it starts compiling, it 
it will soon start running the tests uh, and run all the other gates like uh, performance regression tests, uh, code cop, all these things that, that you might, that we will need in a CI pipeline. Um, and then at some point it's gonna tell you if your code passed or not. If it failed, you need to get back and try to repair it. If you succeeded, then the next thing you need to do is to get some reviewers. So you can go into, oh, oh first of all we need to, this is our pull request now, right? We need to link that to our issue so that we know this issue that we created and that was approved corresponds to this PR. Um, so now these two are linked and we can go back and forth between the discussion that we had in the issue and the code that we develop in the pull request. Um, and now we can add a little tag which is called a needs community review. And this is where then I hope that, because it, it can't be a one-way street, right, where, where the entire partner channel makes pull requests and Microsoft gets the role of reviewing, it simply will not scale. Um, so just as important as coding or making pull requests is reviewing other people's pull requests. And there's also a whole lot of value in these reviews. You will learn a ton of, of, of good stuff. Uh, so I highly encourage you to take, go in, and maybe for starters, just do, pull uh, just do code reviews rather than trying to create PRs. It's fun to do the pull, uh, to do code reviews. It absolutely can be. Um, so this is it, actually. Um, now the things are going to take the turn, and at some point Microsoft's going to say, "Yes, this looks great." Into the product it goes. So I know that was very, very quick, but you can watch it in slow motion, and then you can try to follow along. It is actually, I promise you, it's not that difficult. And if you get stuck, do reach out to me. I'm always happy to help. So what's next here? First news is the system application is moving. It's like, what? Uh, AL app extensions uh, is well, like, we will be moving away from that. And why is that? Well, that is because AL app extensions uh, is polluted. Let me just put it that way. We've got a lot of issues which are not related to the code that is in there, right? All your event requests and so on and so forth, they are in AL app extensions together with the code. Um, there has never really been any process around AL app extensions. Um, the stuff that you just saw actually doesn't really work like that on ALF extensions. So this was just kind of heads through wall, let's do open source. So we need a fresh start. Um, why do we need a fresh start? Well, it's because the uh, Business Central application team also will start developing on GitHub. We will have a common backlog that is open for everyone to see. Um, wait, wait, can I, will I be able to do the pull re code review on your code? Absolutely. Okay. So, and, and we're going to switch from being on the release branch to being on the main branch. So you're going to see what's coming in the next major release. Um, so this is uh, quite the change. I also need to convince our developers that it's a good thing because we also aren't, you know, always perfect and write some really weird code and then it's really embarrassing. Now the world gets to see it. But um, I think it's a good thing. Um, and, you know, why do I think this is a good thing? It's because only then will we really have the full benefit of open development. Um, you know, this give and take is, is really the, the, what makes this a win-win. The one-way street, not so much. So where we will be moving? Uh, we will be moving to github.com Microsoft BC Apps. Yeah, that's nice and short. Um, you can't go there yet. It's still private because we're trying to set up all the CICD pipeline that we need. Uh, we are establishing the process to make it bulletproof. Um, and, you know, this has been ongoing for quite a while, but now we're really getting there. Um, so. I do hope that when we are done uh, and we have wrapped up 2023 wave two, that this will be a good time to say, now we're internally shutting down the repository for the system application and we will be opening on GitHub for everyone. It will probably be from one day to another. I'm gonna make a quick tweet and a Yammer announcement about it and off we go. Uh, of course, the LF extensions repository is gonna be made read-only then for the system application or we're gonna remove it altogether. So that's happening. Is that it, you ask? Nope. We've got more. The system application will be getting a new upstairs neighbor, as we introduced in the keynote. Um, and why are we doing that? It is because we actually want to continue our efforts to componentize the business application platform. I really do believe that the, the, the design and the structure of the system application is so much better than what we have in the base application. So we do want to push this forward. Um, and the system application was actually only ever meant for non-ERP-specific platform-like capabilities, such as blob storage and the likes of it. 
Um, and now we actually want to continue to start taking the things that um, have a business purpose, that have more of an ERP flavor. Um, so we will be establishing the business foundation. We will be developing it fully in the open. Um, soon we will be making the first pull request, where next to the systems folder there will be a probably foundation folder. Uh, and then we're going to push it out there, and you can see what's going on, and you can start contributing, commenting on it, adding event requests, whatever it is that you would like on that module. Not event requests. Yeah, event requests maybe, because now it's, we're redesigning it from scratch. Um, so how are we going to do this? Well, you all know that this is the structure right now, system application, base application, application, under the application umbrella. So we're just going to squeeze in a little layer here, um, our business foundation. Um, the functionality in there is what is used by all or none of the application domains. So, for instance, an application domain is finance. So if there is something that is used in you know, finance and order processing and so on, you know, if it's a common thing, then it will be moved into the f uh, business foundation or if it's not used by any of the, of the specific domains. Um, it will be completely implemented after the same principles as a system application. We will have the better, cleaner APIs. We will have them well documented. They will be fully extensible. They will have improved capabilities, and there won't be any localizations whatsoever in those modules. Um, it will appear non-breaking to all the apps above um, because you are still under the application umbrella. So if you're referencing application, um, it won't break. We will probably have to do some lightweight deprecation um, here and there, exchange some things. Time will tell. Um, again, we will be developing this in the open. You get to see what we do. Uh, and we will be starting out slowly for 2023 Wave 2. Our only goal is to get the number series out. Sounds easy. It isn't. Um, especially thanks to Italy, who has like some really funky number series stuff that now we somehow need to figure out what to do with. Um, but then, given time, other things will come to the, uh, to the business foundation. Dimensions, currency, location, company input, you name it. Um, we also still have stuff in the base application that needs to go to the system application. So we're going to keep pushing or pulling things out of the base application, making it even slimmer, and start establishing these two, or establishing this layer and enriching the system application even further. Hooey. That was it. I don't have any thank you slide because I wanted to go back to your deck, but... <laughs> then I will go to my deck, yes. We actually only have three minutes for Q&A. Um, I will be at the Ask the Experts booth, uh, so if you have any questions, um, you know, do come visit me. I'm happy to talk about this all night long. And me too. <laughs> um, but maybe you have any questions. We also have no t-shirts, so what's the point of a Q&A if we don't have any t-shirts? <laughs> they still can. Yeah, do you have a question? Oh, there is a question. Can I have a beer now? Is that the question? <laughs> Thank you. Hello. Hello. Um, just for me, again, to understand. I, am, uh, I need an unpopular model. Louder. Um, it's, is it, should I go with ideas? Because potentially there will be not much people who support my uh, model. It's or really I hard to hear. Maybe we can just take this offline. Like, oh, yeah, okay. it's okay. like this. I don't know what's wrong with these microphones today, by the way. I can just speak. No, I can, can barely hear you. We'll take that. All right. Thank you, everybody. Beer time. Thank you.